Hello everyone, uh, this is George Giaglis. Uh, welcome to session 10 of uh, the University of Nicosia's uh, free MOOC on uh, digital currency. Uh, this is the first time that uh, I address you. Uh, my colleagues Andreas Antonopoulos and uh, Antonis Polemitis have done the first uh, nine weeks, so we are quite uh, progressed with, with the course. Uh, Andreas has covered the more technical aspects of how uh, Bitcoin uh, operates, what other cryptocurrencies uh, are there, and the different types of tokens. Antonis has covered the more business and financial and regulatory aspects of, um, uh, of blockchain. And I will be with you for the final three weeks uh, of this course. As you can see in your screen today, the topic is blockchain and decentralization. And I'm going to explain what this is all about. Next week, uh, we are going to discuss the convergence of blockchain with other technologies, namely artificial intelligence and the Internet of Things. And finally, in the 12th week, uh, we're going to uh, discuss decentralized finance, DeFi, and we're going to also discuss some end of course logistics regarding how the exams are going to take place for those of you that are doing the MOOC, uh, what is different for those of you that uh, are following the MSc version of this course, uh, and so on. Um, let, me, let me begin with, uh, with today's material and we'll see the rest uh, as we go along. So, uh, what are our objectives today? Effectively, my aim today is uh, to, to, to try and answer a very uh, fundamental question, and it is this question. Why, why all, the, all the buzz and all the noise and all the discussion around blockchain as a technology in the past few years? What is so revolutionary about it? Why do, do, do we care about what effectively is a new way of organizing data in a distributed database in a peer-to-peer -peer network, because this is what blockchains are ultimately all about. And in order to answer this question, we are going to delve into two uh, areas. The first is the concept or and vision of decentralization, uh, why it is important, especially in the context of the internet, how did we start with a similarly decentralized version for the internet in the 90s? How we ended up with a very centralized structure of the internet today, characterized by monopolies across almost all uh, internet verticals, and why it is considered uh, important to, to reinvent or return to the roots of decentralization of the internet. And we're going to see how blockchain fits into this uh, discussion, how it could enable uh, a more decentralized uh, Web3. And we're going to explore some future applications, especially around uh, tokenization, and especially tokenization of real world assets, because I think this is one of the, of the avenues uh, that, that we are uh, going uh, to historically over the past uh, 10 years. So uh, I will start with a discussion about decentralization in general, introduce a framework regarding uh, innovation and how uh, we have seen in previous technological revolutions, a process that in theory is called uh, creative destruction, where old business models are getting destroyed by new paradigms and in the process, uh, uh, new business models native to the new technologies emerge. And we are going to discuss, and this is going to be the focus of, uh, of the lecture today, the two stages through which uh, this happens. Stage one is the stage of disintermediation, so the stage in which traditional intermediaries in, uh, in technological value chains are being uh, replaced or are being obliterated. Uh, and second, the stage of cyber mediation, which is the process through which new intermediaries emerge. And we're going to see this in the context of blockchain. We're going to, to a certain extent, I think, dispel the myth that, uh, you know, blockchains are going to lead to, and crypto is going to lead to a world of 100% decentralization. I think this is not possible. It might be more decentralized in many applications than what we have today, but 
not 100% for reasons that we will discuss, and we will uh, focus on who the cybermediaries of this new blockchain world will be and how they will look like. And we'll, we're going to finish with a discussion about tokenization that I think we are going to, to continue uh, also in week uh, 12 when we're going to discuss uh, DeFi. So let's start with, uh, with um, the concept of decentralization and why it is important to to set the scene for that, let me remind everyone, because I mean, we live our lives without uh, realizing it, that we live in a world in which centralization dominates. Everything or almost everything around us, uh, all the structures of the systems, political, economic, social, family, you name it, uh, are to a certain extent centralized or semi-centralized in the sense that there are certain nodes in all kinds of social and economic networks that have more power than others and to which nodes we have assigned a role of trust. We, we, we use them as trusted third parties to mediate and control relationships uh, between uh, other parties. And this is important because in many aspects of how our world operate we need what we call uh, uh, trusted record keepers so someone to keep track of transactions keep track of the current state of affairs in different aspects of our lives mediate when there is a dispute uh, be the arbiters of truth saying no george you didn't transfer a thousand dollars to uh, manos as you claim because this transaction has does not appear in any of the centralized ledgers that we keep and we and we trust you know the banking system to, to keep accurate records of what is happening so intermediaries plays uh, play play an important role in the way uh, things operate in almost everything we we do and if you think about it everything around us is characterized by centralized ledgers with a trusted record keeper in the middle so when you do transactions with uh, with a friend or with a government or with a business uh, these are mediated by the banking system your academic certificates are being authenticated by the university in which you uh, you graduated from if someone for those of you that are doing for example the msc in blockchain and digital currency if an employer next year wants to verify that the degree you present to them is accurate, they will come to the university and our registrar's office is the arbiter of truth to say, yes, George is a holder of an MSc in uh, blockchain digital currency as he claims, or no, George is not because we don't see him in his records or he never graduated or whatever. So everything is, is centralized and this, is, uh, this has a number of implications. Implication number one, as I've already said, we need to trust the intermediaries because if you do not trust someone to whom you have delegated the, the power to uh, mediate uh, and, and have the final word in transactions, then you have a problem. And this is, you know, this works as long as the party is trusted, but there are a number of situations that might uh, render such parties untrusted. Um, a business failure, or corruption, uh, their systems might be hacked or whatever, and we have a number of problems that emerge when such uh, trust is being broken. The second major issue is that unavoidably, if you have someone as a trusted third party, you give them a secondary role of being a gatekeeper and a controller who has the final word of who can participate in the system and what types of transactions can take place. So for example, we discuss a lot about the problem of unbanked people in the world, but banks are the ultimate decision makers of whether George can have a bank account with them or not. It's not one of my constitutional rights to have a bank account. So if I go to a number of banks and for whatever reason, they tell me, no, we consider you a risky customer. We do not want to open an account with you. There's absolutely nothing in a legal sense that, that I can do. It's a, they are private businesses. They are entitled to refuse to take my business. And 
uh, I might end up being um, excluded from the financial system. Even if I am part of the financial system, they get to control what types of transactions can take place. If I want to buy crypto and I want to send a bank wire to Coinbase or Kraken, my bank, and I mean, here in Cyprus, uh, they will probably do that. They will say, no, we do not uh, do business with crypto exchanges. So even though it is your money, we do not... Uh, um, uh, send uh, the money to the crypto exchange. You can either take your business and go elsewhere or not do this type of business at all. Even though you are not accused of anything, the crypto exchange is not accused of anything. There's no no legal uh, you know basis on that uh, decision. It's just their uh, role as a gatekeeper of the system to control uh, who can participate and what they can do. And finally, and perhaps more importantly. Uh, these centralized trusted third parties may be central uh, points of failure. So uh, they, as I said, they might be hacked, they might lose records, they might cease functioning, a lot of things might happen. And if they, for whatever reason, get out of the picture, suddenly everything collapses. So imagine if, for whatever reason, you know, the bank that you're transacting with loses all their records, the systems get uh, destroyed or whatever, they don't have backups or whatever. Who has what money? What are the balances? Uh, we've seen it with FTX uh, recently in the crypto space. Centralized firms can become single points of failure. And sometimes when they are very large, their failure can create systemic risks for the whole system because they become too big uh, to, to, to fail. So, we would like, in theory, to have more decentralized systems. So we would like to have systems that do not have central uh, gatekeepers or single points of failure. Uh, but we still need these systems to function in the sense of allowing parties that do not know or do not trust each other to transact together on a peer-to-peer -to -peer, uh, basis. The internet was the pioneer of such systems. The internet was deliberately built in the, designed in the 60s and built in the 70s with this architecture in mind. So it's deliberately a system that does not have any central controller, no matter how many internet nodes um, uh, fall, the rest of the network will, uh, will reroute packets and will continue to function uh, as long as there is even a single path between uh, two, two nodes. So we know that we can have decentralized systems. We know that these systems can work, but also uh, having three decades experience with the commercial internet since the 90s, we know today that having a decentralized network infrastructure does not necessarily mean that we can have a decentralized, um, uh, decentralized services on top of it. Bitcoin and other open permissionless networks that you have discussed with my colleagues in the previous lectures are other examples of such uh, decentralized systems. And this is the underlying philosophy and, and need and uh, implications of such systems is what I would like to discuss with you today. So what are the characteristics of such systems? I mean, decentralized ones. They have a number of advantages, but also they have a number of disadvantages. Not everything is bright with decentralization. Of course, it's not like, you know, centralization bad, decentralization good. Uh, things are, uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, more complicated than that. So on the plus side, uh, these systems uh, function on a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, uh, type of working. So transactions can take place without intermediaries. They are distributed, no one is in control, the network is the collection of its participants, and they can be more reliable because there's a significant amount of replication involved. As you, as you know by now, if you have the Bitcoin network, all full nodes keep a full copy of every Bitcoin transaction that has taken place since 2009, since the beginning of the network. So imagine the degree of redundancy that exists in the uh, Bitcoin network and the amount of reliability that uh, this results in, because no matter how many nodes you know uh, go out of the system, there are still many uh, validated copies of the full history of every transaction that has ever taken place. Very importantly, these systems are also censorship resistant, so there's nobody to control the flow of data, there's no bank 
to, to control, as we said earlier, who can have an account or what transactions can take place. As long as I have access to the internet and I have uh, the tokens needed, I can participate in the system and do everything that everyone else can do. Other characteristics, I've, I've preceded them with maybe because it doesn't, these ones, the first uh, four ones are direct results of uh, decentralization. These ones, they may or may not be, you, I mean, you can design decentralized systems that have or do not have these characteristics. So they might be public or they might be private. They might be permissionless or they might be permissioned and they might be immutable as we have in most blockchains or they might uh, have um, uh, uh, functions that allow uh, the reversal or, or change of transactions that have happened in such decentralized systems. Now, on the disadvantage um, uh, side, the security of the system is predicated on the existence of a, of a benevolent majority. So if you want Bitcoin or similar networks to be uh, secure, then you need to make sure that at least 51% of the mining power stays with non-malicious parties. If malicious parties manage to uh, uh, become the majority of voting in the, in the general sense or of validating transactions in the system, then the system falls apart. So you need to have some incentivization mechanism to make sure that uh, the, the majority uh, behaves uh, according to the rules of the system. So for example, miners in Bitcoin uh, receive newly minted Bitcoins or uh, transaction fees. Uh, validators in Ethereum or other proof of stake systems also receive transaction fees uh, from the transactions that they include in the blocks that they publish. In general, you need to have a mechanism to, to make everyone stay um, in line with, with the rules of the system, otherwise the system falls apart. The second disadvantage is slowness. Um, it's, it's funny because I see some presentations that um, among the benefits of blockchain, they, they mention speed. And I wanna tell to these people, where did you see speed? I mean, these systems are by definition uh, much, much less um, uh, fast than centralized systems because of the degree of redundancy. So if especially Bitcoin is, is terribly slow for any, uh, you know, real uh, monetary uh, use because it takes minutes, if not hours for transactions to be uh, securely validated and, uh, you know, enough blocks to, to appear in front of them. Uh, every transaction needs to be broadcast along the world and be picked up by every uh, node in the network. So what you get in uh, for all the advantages on the left, you sacrifice in, uh, in speed. And in general, when you design IT systems, you need to have, you know, to make some compromises. So we use usually this framework called the blockchain trilemma to discuss this, um, uh, these types of compromises. It was originally proposed by Vitalik, uh, the, the founder of, um, of Ethereum. And effectively, the blockchain trilemma says that there are three um, uh, aspects of a blockchain system, and you have to pick when you design it at most two of them, because you cannot have all three. So you can have a system that is scalable and decentralized, but in that case, it will not be very secure. If you want it to be secure and decentralized, it will not be very scalable like in the case of most blockchains that uh, we see today. If you want it to be both scalable and secure, then you it will have to be centralized, okay? So for example, if you are designing Bitcoin and you want definitely to have a decentralized network uh, and this network will handle money, so it will need to be 100% secure. So these things are total requirements probably you will need to sacrifice some of the scalability or the ability of the system to grow or, or, or handle you know, thousands of transactions per second. If you want a system that is able to handle thousands of transactions per second and 
be secure, you will, uh, you will end up with something like uh, Visa or MasterCard. So it will be a centralized network because you cannot have decentralization at, at the same time. Obviously, this is just a theoretical framework. So there's no, you know, th this value, the values of these properties are not binary. It's not either scalable or not scalable. Uh, they are all measured in a spectrum. And what it kind of means is that the more you focus on one of these or two of these uh, properties, the less uh, you can do on the third one. The, the other thing that I would like to, to clear from the beginning is that although I'm, I'm a big believer personally in, the, in, uh, in, center, in decentralization and the benefits of this decentralization for our social and economic systems, I am the first to admit that systems cannot be, and perhaps we do not want them to be, 100% decentralized. So, uh, although there are many maximalists out there that preach, you know, the, 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 the benefits of, you know, full decentralization, I think full decentralization is only achievable uh, under two very strict assumptions. One assumption has to do with the, the blockchain trilemma that we saw in the previous slide. So if you want something that is 100% decentralized, either it will not be able to scale much or it will not be 100% secure. So you have to sacrifice something. And secondly, if you want something that's 100% decentralized, it needs to be esoteric. So even if we could design a network that is 100% um, uh, decentralized and at the same time it's scalable and secure, it would do everything uh, within it. So within the network, you know, Bitcoins will be able to, to flow in 100% secure and scalable way. But as soon as you try to link it to the external world, to anything beyond that blockchain, then you would need to have intermediaries because the problem is that in order to enforce any type of, um, uh, of claim in the real world, uh, let's, let's suppose that you know, uh, by holding a token, um, I get access to a hotel room for a reservation that I've made or whatever, it means that going with my token or my NFT to, to the hotel reception and you know asking for the key to the room, we need I need to trust the receptionist or the hotel manager to actually satisfy my claim and honor that that uh, obligation that they have. If they do not, for whatever reason, they say to me, you know, go away, George. I'm not giving you the room. I've, I've given it to my cousin. There's nothing that blockchain or a decentralized system can do. I need to have some recourse to a legal action or, or something uh, that, that would uh, necessarily mean that I need to trust some type of, of intermediary. So uh, the, the virtues of 100% uh, decentralization are probably uh, inflated. So with this, let's let's view uh, blockchain in the context of, of innovation. And I'm going to skip the, um, uh, the theoretical part. I mean, you can, you can read the slides. Uh, let me say from the beginning that um, I should have said that in the beginning. Let, let me make a parenthesis and say it now. Uh, for those of you that have been in the previous um, lectures with Andreas and Antonis, you who have noticed by now that I'm following a different paradigm in which I am actually going through the material and then taking your questions. So uh, Andreas and Adonis are following a more flipped classroom paradigm in which they, they start and build the, the lecture on your questions. I go through the material and I will be doing this this week and the two weeks uh, that we, we are going to be together. But because the material is, is a lot, I will not be able to go through each and every slide in, uh, in the same detail. So please make sure that you have read the material beforehand to, to, to take as much as you can from the lecture. And please, while we are doing the, the lecture, please ask your questions. Uh, in the end, I will be going through the questions that you have already uh, posted on, on Moodle. And I will also be taking any question that uh, Manos uh, will not be able to answer 
uh, as we go along. Manos is with me. Uh, I will always have either Manos or Lambis or both of them uh, during the, the course. You see two buttons in your uh, Zoom client. One is called chat. I'm not actively monitoring this, so please use it for general discussion around what we're uh, discussing here. The next, the next button is called Q&A. Use that button to ask questions that either Manos will answer uh, in real time as I'm going through the slides, or I will be taking uh, at the end of the course. So sorry that I didn't clarify this from the beginning. So in order to understand how blockchain will uh, revolutionize our world, since I've said that the first example of a decentralized technology is the internet, it might be uh, important to take a step back and remember how the internet changed our world, because I think the process is very, very similar with all radical innovations. And I think the process is, uh, is uh, going through three steps. So step number one, we have some invention. There is some new technology that creates some new foundational infrastructure. So, so in the case of the internet, we suddenly had a decentralized network infrastructure that democratized the exchange of information across the world without borders or whatever. And what happens after we invent such technology is that we start thinking about business users of this technology. And the first thing we do and it's a very natural thing to do, is we think about how we can move existing businesses to the new paradigm. So in the case of the internet, we thought, ah, so we have the internet, we used to do banking on branches, now we can do e-banking or e-health or you know, e-traveling services or whatever. And we, we invented you know, uh, e-commerce, either B2B or B2C. So taking existing businesses and putting them uh, in the internet, and that's fine. I mean, this uh, ends up creating some productivity gains and uh, more frictionless and efficient markets and so on and so forth. But then in this third step, which I think is the most important, there are two things that are happening. The first one is what I called earlier disintermediation. Because of the movement of, of existing businesses to a new technology, uh, many players become irrelevant and they get eliminated. Unless they pivot and they change themselves, they become, you know, Blockbuster or Kodak or all these famous companies that, you know, started as, you know, giants and ended up being uh, bankrupt uh, in the internet era because they, they, they served a role that was simply not required in the internet. And then we are very happy and we preach the benefits of the disintermediation and we say, wow, we have a very decentralized world and flatter uh, value chains and uh, shorter value chains and flatter supply chains and, and so on and so forth. And everybody's happy until 3B happens, until new intermediaries emerge, not the previous players, but new players that couldn't have existed earlier, they are native to the new paradigm, and they capture most of the benefits of intermediation in the new paradigm. So think about, I don't know, Instagram or Netflix or Airbnb. All these companies are companies that couldn't have existed. Their business model was simply not feasible before the internet. But once they existed, they have become quasi monopolies in their space. So we went from a you know, decentralized paradigm to a very, very centralized uh, world, even more centralized than, than before with companies that you know, didn't exist 20 years ago. And now they are the world's top, uh, most valuable companies. And I think this paradigm is a paradigm that we have seen time and again. And it is what we are going to see in the case of blockchain as well. So let's, I have the same paradigm here on the, on the left, and let's see the same thing in the case of blockchain. So step number one, oops. Here. So step number one, we have the invention of a new technology. We have the internet democratizing access to information. Now we have blockchain and crypto democratizing access to value. It has happened. Stage number two. We start thinking how we move existing business 
now existing in internet business to the new infrastructure. Now we used to have electronic supply chains. People started discussing about, you know, blockchain supply chain management or blockchain based health or you name it. It's the stage where we think about how we are going to move existing businesses to, to blockchain. And then we start seeing uh, number three, which is uh, what we discussed earlier. First, some people are going to be, some companies are going to be disintermediated. So irrelevant players, irrelevant for the blockchain era, are going to find themselves unable to operate in the new environment. And then new players that will emerge, which couldn't have existed earlier. They will be native to the, to the blockchain world. Let's see how this might uh, unfold. I think we are, we, are, we are here today. We are probably in the, in the, still in the era where we, we, we are thinking how existing business is going to move to crypto. And we are soon going to find ourselves uh, seeing both a destruction of existing players in the, uh, in the market and uh, new business models uh, arising. So let's focus on the first stage, disintermediation. To think who is going to be disintermediated, who is, who is going to face problems with blockchain, depending on the types of blockchain application that we were discussing, we need to think who becomes irrelevant with blockchain. So this is a this is a very concise definition of blockchain that I like that says blockchain is a technology that allows parties that do not know or trust each other to reach consensus agreement on some sort of shared digital history without a middleman. And obviously, who becomes irrelevant with the blockchain? The middleman, right? Uh, so many people have thought, you know, Bitcoin will recreate the concept of money and we will not need banks anymore. It's funny because I think we might not need banks anymore, or at least the types of banks that we used to have, but not because Bitcoin is going to replace them. As, as, as I've said, and I think those of you that have used Bitcoin in any sort of real uh, transaction in the, uh, in the past few years will agree with me, Bitcoin is a terrible uh, type of money. It's not, it's not good at all for day-to-day for monetary transactions. Banks might face uh, a problem because they intermediate a relationship not between you know, uh, us and our money, but because they sit in the middle of a value chain that has a central bank at the one end and households and firms in the other. So digital money, be that Bitcoin or Ether or central bank digital currencies are going to create the conditions through which uh, we are going to transact directly with the central banks who are the actual issuers of money in the future, they're, they're, thereby bypassing the commercial banking system. And banks are probably not going to, to face so many difficulties in the future because of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies, but because of the ability of programmable money to create uh, new types of, of uh, value instruments that can be um, uh, transacted directly with, with the issuer, with the central bank. So things like uh, this, things like CBDCs can create totally new forms of money that are natively uh, digital, as opposed to Bitcoin or other crypto, they will be legal tender, so they will be legal means of exchange in, in their jurisdiction, and they would be stable by design so they can function as a store of value instrument, uh, which is one of the critical roles that money can play. Uh, and moreover, they could incorporate features that do not exist in today's money. They would have programmability, they would have smart contracts, and they would have stuff that will allow money to become more active than it is today. Money today is a very passive instrument. I mean, they sit in a bank account or, or somewhere and they wait for, for me as the, the owner of the money to tell it what to do. The money of the future might have code attached to it and they might you know, uh, go out there and work for me 
um, uh, in ways that are not possible today. We can have nano payments, so transactions for, for, for microservices that could include services uh, that are assigned to and carried out by machines, creating what we call machine to machine commerce. Uh, and they might give central banks, uh, you know, some, some new monetary policy tools. So some exciting uh, things there outside the scope of this course, we'll discuss CBDCs in our DeFi MOOC for those that uh, uh, follow that course or in block uh, five to nine for those of you that are doing the, the masters. Um, let me say a few things about the second stage, which is cyber mediation, which has to do with who are going to be the new players in the in the blockchain era. So we need to start thinking which which types of business models are native to the blockchain and will be enabled by it. Again, let's look at, at our definition. So if a blockchain is a technology that allows untrusted parties to reach agreement on some sort of shared digital history without a middleman, the new business models I think are going to emerge because we, we are for the first time in history able to extend the definition of who these untrusted parties are. I mean, implicit in the pre-blockchain uh, and pre-digital currency uh, world is the assumption that, that when we are saying uh, untrusted parties, we mean either humans or businesses, corporations, right? Uh, we have uh, consumer to consumer, business to consumer, business to business type of, of commercial activities. However, having programmable money for the first time allows us to include someone else in this equation. And this is machines or code. And for those of you that are following the developments in artificial intelligence lately, I mean, we'll discuss this next week in more detail when we're going to discuss blockchain plus AI. You, you will notice that we, for the first time, can think of situations in which machines become autonomous economic agents. So the, the commerce of the future will not only happen between, I don't know, George and Manos decide to enter into a commercial transaction or agreement, but because, you know, George's laptop and uh, a sensor network owned by uh, Manos or, a, you know, a, a, an autonomous uh, fleet of, uh, of vehicles uh, operating as taxi businesses around us decide to enter into uh, some sort of commercial agreement uh, governed by a smart contract without any human intervention. So we're looking at a totally different economy and this economy will give rise to totally new uh, types of players that simply couldn't have existed before any more than, uh, I don't know, Facebook uh, or Google or Twitter could have existed before the internet, right? So what types of applications can we build on blockchains? I think, I mean, I have a very uh, uh, simple framework to think about these things. Uh, we will see all types of innovations uh, coming out of the blockchain and, and digital currency space from the more incremental to the more radical. And I broadly group them into two, two main groups. The first group is what I call the, the boring stuff. Uh, okay, they're not really boring, but they are the, the in incremental and sustaining types of innovations. They are the you know health applications of blockchain and energy applications of blockchain and supply chain, chain management applications of blockchain and XXX applications of blockchain where XXX can be any sector of your choice. Blockchain will be able to disrupt many existing networking applications in the business world because it makes more sense in an inter-corporate uh, uh, type of, of network. We tend to call these industrial applications of blockchain and they are important. I mean, I don't want to, to diminish their importance. We need that stuff. They will uh, lead to some productivity gains, but in the context of this course, I'm not so much interested in these applications. Those of you that you know uh, work in this 
sectors, uh, you should obviously pay attention to them because they might disrupt the type of work in your business. But what is more important for me is what I call the type B types of applications, applications that are more exciting, they're more radical, they are more native, native in a sense that they could not have existed before blockchain. They are the Airbnbs and Netflixes of the blockchain world. And you know some of the things that we uh, we will be discussing around DeFi in um, in two weeks from now uh, fall under this category. Some aspects of tokenization that we're going to be discussing later today fall into this category. Some things around CBDCs that we uh, saw earlier fall into this category. DAOs, decentralized infrastructure, and so on. They are all important and exciting applications. Obviously, we cannot cover them in one uh, lecture and they are things that are still uh, emerging and we are in the very early stages. But I think, and uh, I would be willing to bet a lot on that, that if we had this discussion 10 years from now, the, the world's biggest companies are not going to be Apple, Microsoft, Google, and uh, Facebook, but they're going to be, maybe some of them are going to continue to be uh, big enough, but they're going to be companies that today are either startups or they haven't started yet. And I used to, to say this argument to my students for, for, for the past three or four years now in, uh, in the context of this course. And uh, I had some, some, some difficulties in, um, uh, in convincing them because although the history of the internet has uh, taught us that such innovations are very short-lived, so when we live through them, they look like they will last forever, but nothing lasts forever. They are very, um, uh, the, 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 the lifespan of companies in the internet era is very uh, short compared to, to previous eras. And they used to tell me arguments like, you know, I cannot see Google, for example, you know, falling from their throne because they monopolize, you know, one of the basic uh, functions of the internet, which is search. And, you know, as the internet gets larger, search costs become even more uh, important. So if you are dominating this industry and you have an advantage against your competitors, who's going to disrupt you? And while I couldn't give them an answer, uh, I, I, I used to tell them that I don't know who exactly or how exactly this will happen, but I can bet that Google will not dominate you know, search in the next uh, 10 years. And suddenly, you know, things like ChatGPT or uh, LL, LLMs in general um, come into play. We're gonna discuss them next week. And suddenly Google's position does not look so uh, defensible uh, anymore. And they're not as invincible as they, as they used to be just a few months ago. Uh, so be careful. This is, a, this is a space that is still um, very, embryonic, very, very new, very mature, and things are going to change a lot. Even if we cannot predict today exactly how the change will look like, the general direction is that intermediaries of the internet era are going to be disrupted and new types of mediators native to blockchain are going to match. So in the next few slides, I have uh, I'm not going to go into details, uh, you can read them, but I have four types of um, uh, industries that could be defined uh, and disrupt uh, existing business models, creating blockchain native business models. These are decentralized finance, so the ability to create uh, you know, credit, um, uh, exchanges, asset management, claims, royalties, you name it, all, all types of financial services uh, through, through a blockchain infrastructure without intermediaries. And if we, if we can manage to create decentralized finance uh, uh, and, and drive mass adoption to it, this is totally going to change our world because we're talking about a, a, a redefinition of the core of how the economy uh, works. 
Uh, we are going to discuss DeFi. DeFi is so important that this thing, uh, we're going to discuss it in detail. We will have a session uh, dedicated to it in two weeks from now. Uh, decentralized infrastructure. So we're building a new layer in the internet, the internet of value. We're building new types of identities that are uh, self-sovereign. Uh, and these are important stuff. We're building decentralized marketplaces, either for data, uh, for prediction, exploiting the, the wisdom of the crowds, um, for things like machine-to-machine -machine commerce. And we are building new forms of governance in the form of decentralized autonomous organizations, digital collectives, and so on and so forth. I have details about some of these things in the slides that follow. But what I would like you to take out of this is that these are not definite. Some of them might work, some might, some might not work. Many others will emerge. What I'm trying to say here is that we are redefining with blockchain stuff that have been around us since the industrial revolution. They have been around us for the past, I don't know, 500 years, and they were not really disrupted with, uh, with the internet. So the concept of money was not really disrupted. The concept of what a corporation or a legal entity looked like was the same in Adam Smith's era in 1776 and more or less the same in the internet era, like what you needed to, 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 to build a, a limited liability uh, organization uh, today. DAOs, collective decision-making, community voting, uh, token-based infrastructure, tokenization of real-world assets, uh, decentralized finance are redefining core values of our societies and our economies operate. So I think they are very, uh, very important. So uh, as I've said, I'm not going to go through the details. Please, you're welcome to, to read through them. These are just some thoughts on, uh, on uh, how uh, native applications for blockchains uh, are going to emerge. But I would like to emphasize that blockchain is not alone in enabling this type of digital transformation. And while the examples in the previous slides and what we have been discussing up to now are enabled by blockchain only, I think the real revolution is happening when different technologies are reaching commercial maturity at the same time, more or less, and they are going to be combined in creating the services of tomorrow. So we have distributed ledgers, we have artificial intelligence, and we have the Internet of Things. And these are the three technologies that we are going to explore um, uh, next week. We're going to see things like, you know, ChatGPT or uh, global sensor networks or things like distributed AI and decentralized AI and see how they will change our world. Uh, I think it's so important that we put it in this introductory uh, MOOC as a dedicated se session that we're going to do next week. But there are other technologies as well. Robotics, uh, augmented and virtual reality, the metaverse, uh, 3D printing and additive uh, manufacturing, uh, nanotechnologies, biotechnologies, new materials, new technologies for storing energy, uh, battery technologies. There are lots of technologies that will combined to re redefine our world and some of the business models, the cyber mediated business models that I've been discussing will, will be built on such technologies. We will have autonomous vehicles at some point, real autonomy. Uh, we've seen the early stages of this and this is a road that we cannot go back into. I mean, this is, this is something that is happening. Synthetic biology, we have started developing even new types of life forms. Uh, that are not based on the on biology as we knew it. Quantum computing or neuroformic, neuromorphic computing uh, are paradigms that might change how uh, uh, computing operates and coupled with things like artificial intelligence might result in, in us not being the world's uh, most uh, intelligent species. Uh, and this will be a, a historic uh, uh, moment in humanity because we, we have been used to dominate the planet and suddenly we have created something that is more synthetic, uh, less biological and yet much more intelligent than us in, in, in ways that are not human, of course, but still it can drive um, progress and innovation which, in ways that we, ca we cannot even imagine today. 
The final thing that I'd like to, to speak about today is, is the process of tokenization. And I'd like to, to bring it up because one could interpret the whole history of uh, blockchain and crypto up to now as a road towards tokenizing stuff. So 10 to 12 years ago, we invented Bitcoin and Satoshi invented Bitcoin and created the first, the world's first native token on the blockchain. And people quickly grasped the consequences and implications of this invention and started thinking about other uses of, of, of tokens. And because they couldn't do otherwise, they were forking Bitcoin and they were creating their own uh, altcoin and their own blockchain focused on, on, uh, on a specific application. And then people said, come on, this is stupid. We cannot have uh, you know, a thousand blockchains each having their own application. So they started um, uh, coloring coins on the Bitcoin blockchain, coloring not literally, of course, uh, started designating specific tokens to function as something more than a simple Satoshi. A trend, by the way, which we somehow 10 years later reinvented a few months ago with ordinals uh, on, on, on the Bitcoin blockchain. Then Ethereum came along and said, come on, we don't need to have many blockchains, each of the with their own token or coloring Bitcoin tokens to denote something. We can have one blockchain and many tokens on it. One native token, Ether, and others, which could be you know, either fungible or non-fungible. And this created a huge revolution. I mean, it was a bubble, uh, ICOs and everything, but it was a huge revolution because we reinvented the way that companies could raise money. And with, with NFTs and the metaverse now, we are moving from purely digital representation of assets to tokenization of real world assets. And I think this is, this is a, a, a predictable path that the world uh, has taken. And I think the next steps are also predictable. I cannot predict when they will happen or who will do them or how exactly they will happen, but the road to tokenizing real world assets and creating frictionless and more efficient markets along the way is a road that we are already traveling and we cannot change. So uh, tokenization is, is the process of using distributed laser technologies to prove someone's ownership of some asset or some right that exists in the real world outside the blockchain. It could be either a physical asset or some digital uh, right. Uh, the benefit is, of course, that we we have now technologies that allow us to create, store, and trade tokens in a trivial sort of way. And there, thereby we can create liquid, liquid markets that are global uh, for almost everything, including fractional ownership of things that weren't typically fractionally owned. So for example, we can have you know, um, uh, real estate tokenization where I can buy uh, you know, minuscule amounts of uh, uh, fractions of ownership of, uh, of uh, residential or commercial buildings and, and you know, invest in, uh, in properties in ways that wouldn't have been possible um, just a few years ago. Obviously, there are challenges here. As I've said earlier, tokenizing real world assets will, in, in the general sense, not be decentralized. We, it will drive a, a, a return to a more centralized paradigm again, because you will always need intermediaries to handle or enforce the execution of the of the rights or ownership um, uh, of, of real world assets. And you obviously need to work with governments because these things need to have legal uh, recognition in order for them to become um, uh, uh, enforceable in the real world. And these types of intermediaries can function, uh, uh, can, can play a number of roles. They can you know, be generators, issuers, validators, custodians, uh, exchange service providers, identity service providers of, of different types of, uh, of tokens. This uh, diagram here comes from a, from a law that was passed in, in, in Liechtenstein a couple of years ago, uh, trying to 
to to regulate the different types of uh, intermediaries uh, for uh, for real world assets and, and the functions and the roles that they can play in the requirements that they should satisfy. One example is real estate. So I imagine it's easy to imagine platforms or exchanges like the cryptocurrency exchanges that we have today, or rather more than the NFT exchanges that we have today, that instead of you know dealing with apes and, and punks, they, they bring together property owners and investors. So they allow someone who owns a property to split it into blockchain-based tokens, probably non-fungible tokens, each token representing a fraction of the ownership of an underlying asset. These owners will be enlisting their properties or parts of their properties and monetize it by selling tokens. So I can you know, monetize 10% of my apartment where I'm today uh, because I need some liquidity. And then there are investors that want to invest in uh, uh, properties in Cyprus, but they do not want, they do not have the money to buy a full house, but they, they would like to receive the yield or the rental uh, or income of, of owning, I don't know, 20% uh, or 10% or 1% or 0.01% for that matter of, of, of a house. Uh, and these investors will acquire the token and receive this income, receive capital gains when uh, the, the property is sold and so on. So the benefits are obvious uh, because for the first time you take something, an asset that is usually monolithic, so a house is either sold and bought in, in its entirety or not at all, and you fractionalize them, uh, the owners can sell ownership rights to any arbitrary percentage of their property. Uh, the investors can acquire property ownership rights anywhere in the world without uh, limitations in terms of capital and expenses. And in general, we create liquid and efficient markets. And if all these things uh, sound like undoable to you, remember that it's only 30 years ago that uh, stocks were bought and sold in paper form and they were mostly better instruments. So whoever wanted to buy uh, a stock of Apple, I mean, Apple didn't exist there, or General Electric or whatever, they would need to go actually to, to, to a broker or stock market, sign a contract, receive, uh, you know, an envelope with, with the shares uh, a few days later. And now we are uh, in, in, a, in a situation that we can buy and sell uh, intraday and high frequency, whatever. I mean, you might not like what is happening, but it has created more efficient markets and more uh, effective uh, price discovery. Real estate today is like the stock market 30 years ago. Uh, we still need, you know, uh, contracts and uh, notary publics and lawyers and uh, judges and, uh, you know, a whole archaic system to facilitate transactions in this market. There is no reason in the world that uh, this cannot be democratized in the way that, you know, capital markets have been democratized in the past. Um, uh, 30 years. So this is a, a, a uh, before and after tokenization comparison of, of changes in the real estate industry and, and some example. So concluding this section, uh, I, I would like to re-emphasize that I, I consider blockchain as a revolutionary foundational technology. It has really changed and it will continue changing the way we view decentralized flow value across the world. As a foundational technology, it can be applied almost everywhere, but the exciting applications are going to be the native ones, the ones that could not have existed before blockchain. Some of these applications include DeFi, de-infrastructure, de-organizations, and de-markets. Uh, at least DeFi we're going to see in detail um, uh, two weeks from now, in week 12. If you are interested in, uh, in, in these types of applications, the University of Nicosia offers a, a full MOOC on DeFi and another one on NFTs and the metaverse, exploring uh, such types of um, applications. Hopefully, uh, in September 2023, we will uh, be offering the world's first uh, master's degree on the metaverse, where we're going to be exploring more uh, of these uh, innovations. I think tokenization is the next blockchain frontier and tokenization could be both about physical assets like real estate or virtual assets like future income streams. So, you know, I, I 
I am in, uh, in, in the education sector. I have some, you know, I've seen some very promising students uh, that sometimes lack the capital uh, they would need to go to do a, a master's degree or a PhD uh, abroad in another university. And I could imagine future income uh, markets where people, investors could crowdfund such a student or a new talent in, in music or, or sports or whatever in exchange of a fraction of uh, this person's uh, future income uh, that will be generated uh, with the help of, of, of the sponsor. So there's a number of things that tokenization can be applied to. And uh, I think we will live in very interesting uh, world and we're going to be seeing such applications. So I will finish here with the, with the, with the presentation. Let me move to your questions there have been a few questions um here we are uh on moodle i would like you to i would like to encourage you both our MOOC students and our msa students to post your questions uh in moodle because i will be uh, uh taking them uh, as we go so Anne is asking that the blockchain trilemma states that blockchains by design can only be two out of these three things should this one be considered the final conclusion or might technology disruption push developers to a level of creating a blockchain which is able to meet all the three aspects? That's a very good question. And the, the short answer is that this is not a final conclusion, right? As I've said, these things are not binary. There's not, you know, a thing is either scalable or not scalable, secure or not secure decentralized or centralized. All these are measured in a spectrum, right? And, and what this framework is trying to, sorry, emphasize is that there needs to be a balance between these three things and we cannot maximize all three variables at the same time. And this is what we think today. Before Satoshi came and created Bitcoin, not only we thought we had mathematically proven that the Byzantine general problem could not be solved in its general form. So we could never have a decentralized system uh, where untrusted entities would transact with each other in a trusted uh, sort of manner. And then Satoshi came along and created a solution that did not solve the problem in the generic sense, but under assumptions, it solves it under the assumption that you know the majority of participants are not malicious in the system. Bitcoin and uh, open blockchains work. So our know-how about what is possible today will change in the next few years. Maybe AI will help us a lot in that. So I think that the answer is today we haven't found a way to, to design a blockchain that is maximally decentralized, scalable and secure at the same time. But that's this doesn't mean that uh, we will not be able to do that in the future. Um, and is asking, is it possible for a radical innovation to incorporate all the four areas of this uh, or they can only exist independently? Obviously, it can incorporate combinations of these areas and other areas as well. These are just examples. They are not um, orthogonal to each other. So for example, many DeFi applications are based on DAOs to, to, to organize community governance. So we, we, only, we already have such applications. Augustine is asking, I don't understand why governments get more control with CBDC than right now with digital money. Most of the money is already digital. We have seen in Canada that the government has already frozen funds of COVID protesters. Yep. Is CBDC more controlling because it eliminates the option of bank runs? No, CBDC is more controlling because it gives to the central bank total visibility of the flow of money in an economy. Uh, the, 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 the existing system where the, the circulating money can be broadly sp split into you know, accounts that we hold with banks and give some visibility uh, to the central bank because they, they can monitor you know the assets and liabilities of commercial banks even if not in real time uh, but the second aspect of money which is cash you know coins and, and bank notes 
they are totally invisible to, to, the, to the central bank. You, you do not know and cannot control uh, the movements of, of that currency. So if you digitize everything and give full visibility to the issuer of money, then the types of things that you can do are amazing, especially if you combine this with, with uh, the, the benefit of programmability, because you, you can have money, as I've said, that has, has code attached in it and you know dictate uh, what happens to this money if it doesn't if it doesn't move or it, it is not spent or depending on where it's spent or when it's spent there's you know the, the types of scenarios on what you can do in terms of monetary policy uh, with with uh, digital currency is 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 amazing. Some of these things, you know, might might result in much more efficient uh, economies. Some others might be very frightening to to those of us that are more sensitive to to, to privacy, individual freedom. Uh, so these are all things, you know, that are under development. But I think the the control aspect of uh, of uh, CBDCs has to do more with the nature of money rather than, you know, um, uh, bank runs. Uh, bank runs, on the other hand, they are quite important because obviously if, if central banks start creating um, CBDCs without restrictions, we're going to see runs from all banks, not only Silvergate and uh, Silicon Valley Bank and Credit Suisse, as we've seen in the past uh, few weeks. But you know, if people hold their money with uh, with a commercial bank that can always go bankrupt, uh, and they have for the first time the the alternative to hold their cash directly with the central bank, uh, which by definition cannot uh, go bankrupt, then obviously everyone is going to take their money from commercial banks and deposit it uh, to the to the to the central bank. So. CBDCs in reality are going to be much more complex depending on their functionalities and the restrictions placed in, in their um, issuance and distribution and the role that commercial banks will have in these things. Um, we will see different uh, you know, pros and cons of, uh, of CBDCs in the future. Still too early to say, but uh, a very important uh, aspect that we will be discussing later on. Q and A. I've seen ten. I've seen ten questions, but uh, Manos has already answered all of them. Thank you very much. So I don't know if there's any other question. I don't see any anyone open. Uh, I'll give you a minute if if someone wants to ask something. Please use uh, Q and A. Um, otherwise, as I've said, next week uh, we're going to explore uh, blockchain converging with uh, artificial intelligence and the Internet of Things. I'm going to see types of applications that we might see there, including decentralized AI. And uh, in week uh, 12, we're going to discuss DeFi and some end of course logistics, uh, including uh, the final exam. Before I leave you, let me remind those of you that are doing the master's degree, not the MOOC students, that um, the, the second quiz is coming up in, uh, in a couple of weeks. Uh, I will remind you again uh, next week and the week after, of course. Those of you that missed the first quiz for whatever reason will be able to take it alongside the second quiz with a penalty to your grade, as we have already announced. With this, thank you very much for, for being with us today. This was session 10 of uh, the, DeFi, the uh, Digital Currency uh, MOOC. Uh, I'm Georgi Aglis, and I will be seeing you again same time next Thursday. Bye-bye.